Welcome to the Candidates Forum for the 2018 general election in Wyandotte County. I am Merle Bland with Business West, the lead sponsor of this forum. Those who will ask questions of the candidates are Mary Rupert of the Wyandotte Daily Online, Elnora Jefferson of the historic Northeast Midtown Neighborhood Association, and Daniel Silva of the Kansas City, Kansas Area Chamber of Commerce. The Kansas City, Kansas Community College also is a co-sponsor of the forum. The forum is being taped by the college's audiovisual department and will be replayed on the college's public cable access channel on the Spectrum and Google networks. The questions are known only to those asking them. Candidates are reminded that this is not a debate and also reminded to stick to the issues. Candidates will have two minutes to make opening remarks. Then they will have one minute to respond to questions. Panelists will have the right to ask follow-up questions. Candidates will have one minute for closing remarks. Our first candidate is Tom Burroughs, the incumbent Democratic office holder Representative 33rd District. His opponent, Jeff Connolly, a Libertarian candidate, was invited but declined to appear. We will be begin the questions with Mary Rupert. Mary? And, and do we want to open with a statement oh, first? Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, Tom, uh, your, your opening statement. Well, thank you and good evening. And uh, it's what an esteemed group of panelists that we have. And I want to thank those that turned out this evening for the debate. Uh, I am Representative Tom Burroughs. I've represented the 33rd District for 22 years. It's been such a privilege and an honor to serve the good people of Wyandotte County and those of the 33rd District. In my 22 years in the legislature, four of those were served as the assistant Democratic leader, two years as the minority leader. Uh, that's, I'm very proud of that fact, having the length of tenure that I have in the legislature to earn the respect of my peers and to be recognized as a leader among them was a tremendous opportunity for our community. I'm running for office again to be that voice of reason, that voice of sensibility, to ensure that our community is represented in a respectful, professional manner, as has been since my tenure. Again, I would appreciate the continued support of this community. It's been a tremendous privilege to serve as your representative for the last 22 years. Thank you. Now we'll uh, begin the questions with Mary Rupert. Mary? Thank you. Um, do you uh, support increased funding for the public schools? And if so, how much of an increase would you support? And, um, and would you change your answer in the event of a recession? Well, educational funding has been a tremendous challenge ever since I've been in the legislature. An issue comes forward every year. As you're aware, last year we started out with about a $500 million increase being proposed. There were a handful of legislators, I being one, that held out stating that we needed to ensure that we met the criteria that was uh, presented to us from an outside council, one that was hired by the leadership team to determine the cost of an education in Kansas, and that came in at a little over a billion dollars. Well, a billion dollars is an awful lot of money to throw into an, uh, to any system in one year, so the discussion was spreading it out over five. I said my position, the reason why I held out initially was I wanted it to go over a three-year time period so that we had a chance to once again hire teachers and put the money into an education program that met the criteria of the equal, equalized funding, adequacy, and equitable uh, funding for our, our school districts. So would I fund additional dollars for education? I believe we should fund additional dollars for education. They've been sh sh uh, they haven't been fairly funded in the last eight years. So they, they absolutely need at least another 300 million this next year and possibly another 400 million the following year. Now the question is, where does that revenue come from? I think it's awful early for us to be talking about uh, tax increases with the federal changes that were made by the president as well as the taxing, the taxing plan that was replaced 
that replaced the brownback tax plan as of the 2012 and in 2015. There are uh, a number of initiatives that will affect how much money and where that money will come from when it comes for education. Now we will move to Eleonora Jefferson. Okay, all right. Eleonora. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, continuing on that line on education, there are some who are proponents of charter schools and proponents of vouchers. And have you considered that? And if you have, what, has, what is your bottom line decision on that? You know, I, I have a, a very diverse district. And in that district, there has been homeschooled, charter schooled, and privately schooled students. And I have found each and every one of them to be uh, educated in a manner that is conducive to that environment. Good, bad, or indifferent, it, and I'll leave that judgment up, up to others. But I will state that uh, I believe that as a, as a state-funded mandate by our Constitution, those dollars should go specifically to public schools, not to charter schools unless they are approved by your local school district. Or uh, and nothing for vouchers and uh, nothing for homeschool. Now homeschool, the issue with homeschool is sometimes those children aren't the aren't checked on during the day. So are they really getting the education? And we've had instances where some of the children there was question uh, about their overall health and well-being, and there was a push, if I remember correctly, due to an incident happened, a very tragic incident happened here in Wyandotte County to allow the state a, a way to at least inspect the school, whether it be home, a charter, or public. Thank you. Now we'll turn to Daniel Silva. Thank you, Merle. How you doing, Representative? Uh, this question is around, um, obviously, with a business uh, focus on it. Uh, the KCK Chamber supports an aggressive effort, including increased education, public awareness, and potential future legislation design to provide local school districts, state universities, and other publicly funded governmental entities the latitude necessary to direct their purchases to Kansas City metropolitan area based vendors, where there is minimal price difference. We call this buy local. Mm -hmm. Would you support a buy local initiative? Why or why not? And I think that's a great dis discussion to have. When it comes to our business community, we should all be partners in our community. Those public dollars are some of our tax dollars in those public dollars that support our mm -hmm. institutions. If there has been much discussion, not only about buy local, but the lowest qualified bid for local communities and vendors, the, the question ha has been that five to 10% gap. I'm open to that discussion. I believe there's some devil in the details that should be worked on, but I believe that we're all partners in this process. I like to keep that local dollar spending locally, the turnover, six to ten, ten dollars per dollar spent in the community. So it's, a, it's an issue that I would uh, give strong consideration to. Thank you. Now we'll turn to Mary Rupert for another question. Thank you. Um, what changes would you support to the Kansas child welfare system and why? Well, due to a tragic incident that happened over a decade ago, I put forward the legislation that's in place at this time that records could be opened upon the death of a child. I believe that legislators need more access to children in need of care. In my experiences in the legislature, I have found it quite difficult. We, it's not that we want to pry into every case, but we, we receive letters, communications, whether it be phone or uh, telephone calls or uh, even um, personal visits by those that have been impacted by the uh, children in need of care. It's difficult in Kansas to provide the amount of resources necessary to deal with the over 6,000 children that are in state custody. And we know what happens when those children are separated. The anxiety level of both the parents and the children are, uh, are quite evident, whether it be through the court system or through the estranged system of foster parenting. I would, I would like to see us have an opportunity as legislators to hold the DCF accountable when a child goes missing or when a, when a foster parent has a substantiated uh, instance 
of abuse or arrest or a substantiated uh, accusation that would allow the DCF enough resources to address those issues. We are underfunded and underpowered in the DCF office. Our, our caseworkers have probably four times the normal amount of children in cases to, to uh, investigate and to handle, and that, that is a sad state of affairs. Eleonora, the next question. Okay, thank you. I was just pondering the answer to that question. Um, Senator Burroughs, why, why do you think that is four times DCF here, the State uh, Department has four times the burden uh, elsewhere? Well, it's not just unique to the DCF. Unfortunately, DCF is the one right now that's drawing a lot of attention. If you remember, we also had an issue with the Driver's License Bureau. We also had an issue with the funding for education. When, uh, when we had a tax plan that was very uh, destructive to our economy in the state of Kansas, it affected a lot of public services. And there's only one thing that happens when there's very little money, and that's personnel cuts. And the state moved a lot of employees. There were a lot of employees released. Offices were consolidated. Services were limited. And what we are witnessing now is the fallout from some of that. And it's, uh, it's unfortunate. You throw the recession in on top of that, and we were near bankrupt in the state of Kansas. And we're not, it took us a while to get there, and it's gonna take, take us a while to get out of it. And what we need to do is, the prudent thing to do is just take a breath, see where the economy is with these two tax plans, as I stated in my opening comments, to let the uh, economy settle a little bit so that we have a better understanding of where we are, instead of just willy-nilly coming in and raising taxes and, and proposing tax cuts here. But we do have a lot of bonded indebtedness that we as a state are responsible for, and that has to be repaid. Daniel, your next question. Yes, uh, my question is around star bonds. Uh, what is your position on star bonds and their use as an economic tool? What are some highlights you'd like to point to and maybe some challenges uh, that have come up? You know, I've always, uh, I carried the in initial star bonds legislation for the Kansas Motor Speedway for Wyandotte County. And to this day, I still say it's the best economic development tool in the country when it's utilized properly. What we've seen with star bonds is, is the success that Wyandotte County had because of the due diligence by our local leaders and the partnership with their delegation and with the Commerce Secretary. But what we've witnessed is a lot of developers want the project, uh, want star bonds to meet the criteria of the project and not have the project meet the criteria of star bonds. And there are thresholds that need to be met in star bonds. And there are instances where some people don't want to put up the revenue to meet that standard, or they want to go above the 50% threshold. I see the 50% threshold as the ceiling. And some of us see it as a, a, as a glass ceiling, you might say. They want to bust through that and have the state partner and be, be uh, uh, more of a financial partner than the 50%. I'd like to see us even lower that standard a little bit and put more private equity into the star bonds. But I believe it's the best economic development tool. We've seen the success. It's, it has brought Wyandotte County economically. When it's used properly, it is a very successful economic development tool. And I'm in strong support of star bonds. Thank you. Mary, the next question. Thank you. Um, there are four public school districts in Wyandotte County. Would you support any efforts in the legislature to consolidate school districts statewide or to reduce administrative costs somehow? The administrative cost is an issue that I'm sure will be discussed in the next education package. I'm opposed to consolidation, and it, it, it doesn't work well in an inner city. Now, there's been discussion about consolidation in our rural communities, but we have some children that are on school buses for well over an hour, and their roads are unimproved, and it's very difficult for me to imagine that if you consolidate a school in rural town Kansas, when you lose, when you consolidate that school, one of the towns is going to lose a building, it's going to lose its teachers, some of the higher paying jobs are your educational field. It's not any different than when they close down a hospital or a small business. You lose those that make a, 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 large, a healthier wage and it does affect the economy. 
But I am not one that, wants, that believes we should be talking about school consolidation. What we should be doing is look, working towards a uniform formula that is fairly funded to ensure all children, no matter what their social economic impact or environment may be, has an opportunity for a quality education. Elnora, your next question. Okay, thank you. We change uh, subjects a little bit to something that's probably not as, um, as uh, um, well, maybe easier. That's a little wet there. <laughs> and what is the uh, largest obstacle that you have found in working across the aisle? You, will. you know, I, I think it comes down to who you are in reference to working uh, across the aisle. As I stated in my own opening comment, having served in leadership, that doesn't happen by being on an island by yourself. Uh, in the 22 years I've been in the legislature, I, I believe personal integrity is extremely important when dealing with others. And I can, I can look some my fellow legislator in the eye and tell them how I'm going to vote on an issue and not be concerned if I'm misleading them. That, that's that open rapport that I have. I, I work well with those on the other side of the aisle. When, when I was Democratic leader, we had 28 and we were outnumbered by excess of 90 on the other side of the aisle. So it, it, it mandated working across the aisle in order to advance policies, and we were successful in doing that. Uh, I believe it's it, the, the responsibility of the individual legislator, legislature to build their network in the legislature. That's the only, I, Tom Burroughs can't do anything by himself. It takes 62 other votes plus mine to be a, a simple majority in the Kansas House, and we've been effective with doing that when I come home and look at what I've been able to provide for our community. That bipartisanship is extremely important in the legislative process. Daniel, your next question. Thank you. Um, you know, the KCK Chamber proudly represents about 500 uh, members, business owners. Of those 500, about 60% of those is what we would consider small businesses, 25 employees or less. What can the Kansas legislature do to continue to be a good partner to small business or become an even better partner to small business, specifically those in the urban core? I believe to be a, a good partner, we need an educated workforce. I think when we have an opportunity to encourage entrepreneurship and economic stability within a community, uh, after we have economic instability, you have people that are ready to be entrepreneurs on their own. We as a state should help with that. We should offer um, think tanks. We should offer a, a, a human resources environment that allows those that uh, want to start small businesses a network system in which to initially help them thrive and become successful business owners. But I truly believe an educated workforce and a stable uh, tax plan, not one that's thrown out every year that keeps the stability of a business and, a, and of a local economy and a statewide economy in turmoil. Tax stability is, is really one of the best things we can do for business. Thank you. Mary, the, your next question. Okay. Um. I'm interested in your position on um, the sales tax on food. Why hasn't it been uh, cut? I believe it will be uh, a topic of discussion this next session. We'll know how much the, the tax plan that was implemented last session will uh, bring to the state in total. To reduce the sales tax on food, I believe, is for every penny Oh, I hate to I hate to make a guess. Those numbers were with me six months ago, but the to lower the sales tax on food will be one of the top priorities of the Democratic Caucus. I know, and I believe it will be a bipartisan effort because we're hearing it from from all the candidates that are running not only uh, in the governor's race but uh, in the House races across state. Sales tax on food is second highest in the nation, and we shouldn't be taxing the very supplement of existence for many families. And I just think it's a very regressive tax and it needs to be addressed and lowered. Eleonora, your next question. Okay, thank you very much. So along the line of incentives for development, there as the, um, recently we've had the Economic Opportunity Zone mm -hmm. federal initiative. There has been at least one, um, the Brownback Rule 
uh, enterprise initiative that was successful in stimulating the economy for the rural areas. But we have not made any movement on the urban opportunity zones, nor have we made any movement on earnings tax. As we look across the river and we see what's happening in Kansas City, Missouri, I would imagine there's a measure that be, can be contributed to that. What do you see as the possibilities for either or both of those plans to be pushed through the legislature? And if not, what would be the obstacles in getting it done? Well, I'll answer the last question first. The obstacle will be the, uh, the tone of the legislative session. We're going to have new n members coming in this session. It'll take a little while to find out where they are on tax policy, but if we're talking about, if I can go back to the last two years, and then the two years before that, there was a no tax increase mindset in the Kansas legislature, and you've seen that they were even punitive to local governments by putting a cap on the, what local governments could do on, on raising taxes. The sales tax on food is a very regressive tax. To try, as well as the property tax, is the one that we hear mo most about is property tax. And to add an additional tax burden by earnings tax in a community is a tough sale. And while we understand the significance of having an earnings tax in, in, in our community, be mindful, a lot of those jobs are held by what, we, what are referred to as sundowners. They come in and work those jobs and they go back to their local community. Now, we vote for that, but if businesses want to come in into our community, are they going to want to be uh, responsible for that earnings tax and the uh, responsibility to capture that earnings tax? The issue of any tax increase will have to be, the tone will have to be registered early on in session. The tax issue, there will be some that will want to cut taxes. As I stated, I think that's a little premature. And I think there will be those that will want to raise taxes in order to uh, pay back the bonded indebtedness, some of the other uh, monies that we owe other agencies and other funding mechanisms that we used to borrowed from ourselves to balance the budget. Those need to be repaid. So as I stated, we're not going to get out of all of this overnight. It's just going to take a while. But the tax discussion is going to be one I think will take up the biggest part of the session. Okay, thank you. Daniel, your question? Sticking on the uh, tax theme that, that we're on, uh, please share with us your position on origin versus destination-based sales tax. Well, I'd like to see that revenue, sales tax revenue uh, in Wyandotte County stay. As you know, the, I'm trying to remember the name of the, uh, I think it was one of the Dakotas that was dealing with the uh, it tax issue and destination and already part of the streamlined sales tax that went into play years ago. There's the, the impact on small businesses of my concern. What impact will it have? Uh, what's the financial impact it will have on them? And then the auditing impact it may have very well have on small business. If we're going to move to, from one to the other, we, we need to have a, a more of a case study and, a, and I would call it a governmental partnership to ensure that we are able to address it in a manner that doesn't create a hardship on our small business, at the same time captures the revenue that we hope it will capture, and uh, level the playing field between our brick and mortar and our dot coms. Sure. Thank you. Tom, you now have one minute for closing remarks. Well, I'd really like to thank the panel for their questions this evening. And we, we have an opportunity as we move forward. We have a new administration that will be coming forward in the state of Kansas. I stand ready to partner with those that, that want to put our state on the path of economic stability. That instability over the last handful of years has been quite challenging, not only for the state, but for local governments. As through the questions this evening and my responses, we've seen the impact on social services, education, and uh, even the medical industry. And, I, and the financial impact it's had on our state as a whole has put us at great financial risk. I stand ready to right the ship, to partner with those that are willing to move our economy and our state forward. And it's been an honor and a privilege to serve the good people of Wyandotte County, and I plan to continue to do that as long as they'll continue to vote for Tom Burroughs November 6th. Okay. Thank you very much. This concludes this portion of the forum.